Okay, now we're ready to cut the mortise and the tenon. Um, this part of the build process can generate a lot of anxiety amongst new builders and even for people who've been building for a really long time. Now for a while I thought about what method I wanted to teach here and you know how I usually like to address multiple options so you the builder can choose what you want to do based on the tools you have, how much time you have available, your experience. Well, I thought about it and I concluded that there's really only one method that I use and that I would recommend to you, the builder, so it wouldn't really be right for me to push you in the direction of some of these other methods. So we're going to focus on what I consider to be the best method for getting great results um, when cutting your mortise and tenon. So this is the Robert O'Brien mortise and tenon jig, also called the neck angle jig. Um, my one reservation with showing you this method was that I was worried that some of you might look at this jig and think, I'm not doing that. Um, it looks a lot scarier and more complicated than it really is, mostly because I have added, over time, a lot of uh, different things. I've really customized the jig, for example, this uh, acrylic screen here isn't at all necessary to the, the function of the jig. It's, it can be removed, as you can see, and it simply um, is a hookup for the shop vac and a screen for uh, keeping the chips and things from coming back at me. And if I remove this, uh, remove some of these other, these um, two bars that I've added here, if I really strip it down to what it is, it's, uh, it'll appear a lot more manageable to you. So keep that in mind. I'm not going to talk about building this jig or anything like that because there's already plenty of information out there on the web from Robert O'Brien himself on how to do that. And if you do get plans from LMI, they'll send you a video um, on exactly how to put everything together and even on how to use it. So I'm not going to rehash over information that you're going to see anyway when you uh, order these plans. Um, and there will be a link for all these other videos that I mentioned related to this jig. There will, there will be links in the um, notes for the lesson. So the first step really is to follow the links in the that I've left in the lesson and uh, get plans for this jig, build this jig. Uh, LMI may even in the future have the jig already finished for sale. I, I believe that might be something they're doing. So you may not even need to order plans and build the jig if you're intimidated by that. You may be able to just simply buy it. You can pause the video right here, watch those videos, and then come back here and re-watch the rest of this video. And I'm going to show you my process for using this jig. There's going to be a whole bunch of uh, tips and tricks for getting the most out of the Robert O'Brien neck angle jig. And then I'll also explain some of the bells and whistles that I've added to my jig, which uh, really optimize this jig. They're not essential to using the jig, but they, um, they fine tune the jig and solve a lot of the uh, common problems that people have when using this jig. Um, one more thing, the main function of this jig is um, to allow the router to cut the optimal angle into the shoulders of the tenon so that when we call it the neck angle jig, what we're referring to is the angle in this direction. Okay? So there's an optimal angle that most builders agree upon um, which will give us the best possible range of adjustments later on when we do the neck fit and um, when we finally give the, the whole instrument a setup. That is the, the primary purpose of this jig, is to set that angle. Now at the same time, while we're cutting that, we can save ourselves a lot of time, and that's what a, a lot of these tips and tricks for using the jig um, are really just time savers further on in the guitar building process, so we don't have to swing back around and, and 
fix and adjust these later. Um, so what I'm talking about is the neck angle not back to front, but the neck angle side to side. If we do everything right with this jig, that should also be dialed in pretty close to where it should be. I wouldn't stress out about that side to side setup too much. If you botch that a little bit, that's okay. We have ways of uh, bringing that into alignment later on. What's really important with this jig, and it's important to understand this uh, when you're starting out with this jig, its primary function is that front to back angle. That's why we call it the neck angle jig. Okay? First, we will cut the mortise. I trace out the jointed center line so I can properly align the body in the jig. You can see here I am marking the center line in a few places where I can reliably identify it as the jointed line and not mistake it for a grain line. At this point with the binding in place, it can be extremely difficult to find the line. Sometimes the best place to look is on the edges of the sound hole. The glue line reveals itself here where the angled grain line disappears. You can see it just to the left of the pencil mark. Similarly, you can look for anywhere on the top where two grain lines converge into a V shape. I connect the marks with a straight edge. Also at this time, I make a mark 287 millimeters from the neck bearing surface where the 14th fret is located. This is the distance from the neck joint to the approximate location of the saddle. Keep in mind that this measurement is for a guitar with a scale length of 25.34 inches and 14 frets to the body. If you are using a different scale length, check your plans for the appropriate measurement. Also notice that from this point forward, these marks and any other marks I make on the soundboard are very light, so they can be easily sanded out later. The purpose of this mark will become clear when we set up the jig to cut the tenon. It is critical that the neck bearing surface is flat. That is not flat. Notice the gaps. I also check it diagonally and I check it this way as well. If you want a truly flat surface, it makes sense that you use a truly flat sanding block. So I make sure my block is flat. As always, the block is padded with cork and there are no loose ends of sandpaper. I mark the area up with pencil so I can monitor my progress. The area we are concerned with making flat is actually very small. Now I sand in a circular pattern to avoid tipping and inadvertently rounding over the ends. Now I clamp the jig to my workbench with the mortise side of the jig facing out. As a simple precaution, I place my go bar deck and a soft carpet fragment below the body clamp of the jig, just in case I'm fooling around with the jig and I accidentally drop the body. It's a long fall to the floor, but a short fall to the top of the go bar deck. I loosen the sliding bolts for the body clamp and place the body in the clamp until it butts up against the roof of the jig. Through the window, I line up the center line of the body with the center line in the window of the jig. Now I slide the mortise template all the way back to reveal a small gap between the body clamp and the body. 
This gap is the result of a simple modification to the jig. I've removed the cork and sanded a slight relief into this area of the clamp, just enough to be able to fit a square in the gap between the body and the clamp. I slide a 12 inch tri-square into this gap. The bearing surface of the square bears against the mortise template, while the long arm of the square extends down across the body. I line up the center line of the body with the square. Now I know the mortise will be cut square to the body's center line. I make sure the body is clamped in tight and I tighten the sliding bolts as well. I remove the square and turn my attention to setting the height of the mortise. This is not a critical measurement. I like to set the peak of the mortise to about a millimeter or so above the binding. You can also check the distance between the body and the template at the back of the mortise and at the front. If you have different measurements, then the body is tipped. This will result in a mortise that is deeper at one end, which actually isn't a big deal unless the difference in depth is extreme. Here, my measurements are spot on, but I would have accepted as much as a 16th of an inch difference in measurement from one end to the other. Now we are ready to route. For this jig, you need a plunge router, a guide bushing to bear against the template, and a half inch straight cut bit. I recommend using a bit that is two and a half inches long. The common one and a half inch long bit is just barely not long enough. Before we get started, I'm going to clean and wax the plunge posts. It only takes a minute and having a smooth plunging action makes routing here a lot more enjoyable and safer too. I use paste wax and I make sure that I wipe away all excess wax before I use the tool. Too much wax will actually attract wood dust and actually gum up the posts. Now I place the router with the guide bushing on the template. I plunge the router down until it bottoms out on the guitar body and I lock it in place. With the bit bottomed out on the guitar, I set the depth of cut to 7 eighths of an inch. I like Robert's idea of cutting a small block to 7 eighths of an inch and using that to set the depth gauge. The depth is set and I can remove the block and release the plunge lock. Now the router can plunge no further when this post meets this pad. I attach the shop vac hose. The attachment for the hose is simple enough to cobble together. I cut a hole into a piece of scrap just big enough for the hose to be held snug. Then I cut two scrap pieces at 30 degrees on the miter saw, although the exact angle isn't very important. I attach the original scrap piece to the two mitered pieces with drywall screws, placed a square of acrylic across the mitered pieces, and screwed the whole thing down with two drywall screws. Now I plug in the router. I always wait until setup is complete before plugging in any power tool. For the first pass, I lower the bit to just pass the binding and purfling scheme. I first want to clear the binding and purfling on both sides, and it's best to remove the binding and purfling from the top down. For this reason, I don't do a full pass here, because on the other side, I would then be coming up behind the binding and purfling which can actually pop it out of place. Instead, I stop the, the router, 
after I've cleared the binding on the one side. And then I reset the router on the other side to safely remove the binding and perflink, again, from the top down. Now I can do a full pass. I go slow, allowing the bit to clear the wood that's in front of it. And I try to apply no downward pressure on the router as I go. The downward pressure thing isn't a big deal here with the mortise, but regardless, it's good practice for when we get to the tenon, where pressing down with the router can really throw off your results. By the way, the view through the acrylic window is actually a lot clearer than the camera would have you believe. The camera likes to focus on what's in the foreground, like glare and bits of dust on the acrylic. Now I lower the bit a little more and make another pass. When I lower the bit between passes, I do so in the open airspace between the viewing window and the body. While the bit is designed so that you can plunge it while it's spinning straight down into the wood, you want to avoid this whenever possible to save the bit. It's hard work for a bit to plunge straight down into wood, and it actually cuts more effectively moving across the wood. Not to mention, when you're plunging the bit down, you are obviously applying down pressure. And as mentioned before, limiting down pressure during the cut will be very important when we cut the tenon. Finally, I lower the bit for a final pass. Wait until the bit has completely stopped spinning before lifting the router. I remove the body. And that's the mortise, a good, clean, and square cut. Now I spin the jig around to the tenon side. It's easier to get the clamps on without the screen in place, so I remove that first. Notice that I cut away the corners of the hinged board to allow for better clamping access. I think the latest Robert O'Brien plans have accounted for this as well. Now we are ready to set the neck angle. Keep in mind that we want to be extra critical of our measurements when cutting the tenon side. With the mortise, you can be off a little bit one way or another and not expect any real consequences to our neck fit. The tenon cut, however, is very touchy. So touchy, in fact, that the weight of the router and the weight of the acrylic screen and shop vac hose can change my neck angle at the saddle by as much as 3 64ths of an inch. So when I set the angle of the hinged board, I set it with the router, acrylic screen, and hose in place. That way, every factor is accounted for. Now remember the neck bearing surface that we sanded flat? I placed that surface on the jig and pushed the body up against the metal bar. The body should contact the metal bar at the mortise. Remember the mark we made for the saddle location? I want to adjust the hinged board until the metal bar sits about 9 64ths of an inch off of the top at this mark. Notice how I have a finger keeping pressure on the back of the instrument while I check. Looks like 10 64ths of an inch at the saddle location. That's pretty close. Let's see if we can get it just a little bit closer. I adjust the hinged board by turning the knobs in the back and in the front. Now that is spot on at 9 64ths of an inch. Now I'm going to remove the router, the acrylic screen, and the shop vac hose, 
and check the measurement again just to demonstrate to you the effect that the weight of these items can have on the measurement at the saddle. Looks like it now reads 7 64ths of an inch. So the weight of those items adds 2 64ths of an inch to our measurement. Next, I remove the wing nuts and clamping pads, and I push the bolts all the way back so they're out of the way. I lay out two strips of painter's tape in the area where the neck will be held. I hold the neck against the board. The dowel that I've installed acts as an index pin to center the neck in that area. It is sized to fit in the truss rod slot. Now I make a mark on each side of the neck at the top of the board. Now I slide the tenon template forward to reveal two slots that I've cut. This is another modification I've made in order to accommodate the use of a tri-square. I insert the square into the slot and allow the bearing surface of the template, I'm sorry, of the square to rest on the template. I line the square up with the marks I've made at the top of the tape and carry those marks down the length of the tape. The neck can now be clamped in perfect alignment along those lines. This will save you some time later when we do the neck fit. Note that this is a bit different from how Robert O'Brien aligns his necks using two dowels in the truss rod slot. O'Brien tapers his necks before using the jig, so he uses the truss rod slot as his measure of center. I don't taper the neck until after this step so that I can center my neck off of the sides of the neck instead of the truss rod slot. The only reason I bring this up is to say that either method works great, but whichever you choose to use, it is a good idea to check your alignment with a square. I know that my truss rod slots can sometimes be just a little out of alignment from one end of the neck to the other, so using the square like this saves me some work later when we do the neck fit. Next, I measure the height of the mortise off of the body and transfer that measurement to the neck. I pull the bolts back out and add the wing nuts. I position the neck on the dowel, add the clamping pads, and tighten just enough to hold the neck. I slide the neck up until it butts up against the bottom of the template, and I lock it in place. Now I want to make sure that when I set the template to the height of the tenon, the template is not cocked one way or the other. I do this by lining up the back edge of the template with the playing surface of the neck. I then trace the tenon. Now when I slide the template back so that the peak of the tenon lines up with the mark I made for the tenon height, I know that the tenon is square to the playing surface of the neck, as long as I can see those two lines that I just traced. I tighten down the template, and I trace the template's outline. I also make a mental note of whether or not the surface butts up flush against the template, or if it's angled one way or the other. As Robert O'Brien mentions in his videos, it's not critical that it's perfectly flush. In the end, the tenon won't bottom out in the mortise anyway. Now I remove the neck to cut away some excess material outside of the template lines and to correct the angle of the surface if necessary. First, I remove the excess material with a coping saw. 
Now I correct the angle of the, the sanding block. A lot of people struggle to get this angle right. And again, as Robbie mentioned, it's not all that yet. So I wouldn't stress out over it. Here I am just checking my work. It looks good, so I place the neck back in the jig. This time, rather than butting it up against the template, I lower the neck enough so that the guide bushing can be used. One last time, I make sure that the neck is lined up with the lines on the blue tape, and I tighten down the wing nuts. I make a reference mark on the neck and the blue tape, just in case I need to remove the neck and place it back in this orientation later. Now, one final check of the measurement at the saddle with the router, acrylic screen, and shop vac hose in place. Now that we've added the neck to the equation, we may have thrown off the measurement slightly, and it's not too late to adjust that hinged board. Okay, looks good. Still at 964 of an inch, so we're ready to route. I bottom out the bit, lock it, and set the depth gauge to 7 eighths of an inch. Towards the back of the template, there are two air spaces where I can lower the bit between passes. The air space to the right contains a brass hinge which you can hit if you're not careful. Trust me, I've done it. So I stay out of that airspace. The airspace to the left, however, is where I lower the bit between passes. This is important to only plunge the bit in this airspace so we don't apply down pressure on the workpiece. Now I make the cut. It's worth repeating that down pressure while routing is not only unnecessary here, but it can also really throw off your measurement at the saddle, which you worked so hard to set up. So go slow and don't bear down on the router. Okay, now for a big dramatic moment, let's check it and see how we did. Now the tenon is, I can already tell the tenon here is uh, taller in the back than it is up front, and so it's actually bottoming out on the mortise and throwing everything off, which is normal, that's um, sort of expected. I expect that to happen, and then what I do is I just touch up the back of the mortise, or I'm sorry, the back of the tenon, or wherever the tenon is too tall, and I touch that up until it does, until these uh, shoulders sit flush on the neck bearing surface. So you can see that gap right now. And just so you know, the tenon isn't actually supposed to sit, it's not supposed to bottom out and sit. Um, this isn't supposed to make contact with the bottom. There's actually supposed to be a little bit of a gap there to allow for expansion. Um, not to mention it would be nearly impossible to get this set up right without allowing that gap. It just makes the, our job a lot easier. So it's fairly easy then to um, sand this 
back because I'm not too worried about how much of a gap I have. But before I take this to the disc sander, let me just show you another way that we can confirm that we are in fact bottoming out and that we don't have uh, a different problem. So of course, you can, this gives you an idea of what's going on, just the fact that there's a big gap back here. But I can see exactly where it's bottoming out if I just apply a little chalk to the bottom here, the bottom of the tenon. I blow away the loose chalk so that that doesn't just fall into the mortise and uh, give me a false positive. And now I'm just going to carefully place this in there. Move it around a little bit like that. And pick it up. And I can see it's all. You can see there's chalk piled up here in the back. It might be hard to see with the shadows. Hear that too. Feel that. Feel that drag. Yeah. Anytime you get that sound, you know you're uh, dragging the bottom of the. Tenon. So let's go ahead and sand back just that part of the tenon, and then see where we're at. Okay. There it is. Much better. Now that's what it should look like. As you can see, it's gapless all the way around. I'm not getting that sound I was getting before. And even if I would check with the chalk, I won't get any chalk in there. Um, and once again, it's better in this case to err on the side of, you, you can have sort of a large gap there, that's okay. So better than having the, the tenon sort of seesawing on the, the bottom of the mortise. You don't want that. Okay, now the last thing you want to do is just check it. So you want this where, where the uh, tenon meets the body. That's going to sit flush so I can't feel my fingertip over that. And then once I get that in place, I can hold it down with my thumb. Hold this right there. And this is kind of hard to do by yourself. Um, I would recommend having a friend. Check down here, and that looks good. Uh, one last thing to mention, um, the side-to-side -side orientation should be pretty spot on because we uh, if we did everything right um, but that's not something I'm even going to worry about right now because we'll, later on when we go and do the neck fit, neck fit we're going to revisit all of this and um, that's one thing that we'll, we're really going to dial in is that I keep hitting this light is that side to side uh, orientation but right now for now as long as the neck angle in relation to uh, where the saddle location is. As long as that angle is good, uh, we're ready to move on to the next step. Mm -hmm.